Good more evening, Fountain of Life. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us today for this Facebook Live broadcast, and I believe that this is going to be something that's really going to minister to you. We're going to be talking tonight on how to enjoy your life no matter what. Let me tell you something. Our world is struggling right now, and uh, and uh, we need to pray for our world in a big way. We want to just uh, take a moment or two as people are joining us uh, on this Facebook Live broadcast to pray for the United States of America. Our, our country is struggling right now. And, uh, you know, but the beautiful thing is that I see in our world is that there are churches like ours where there are all kinds of races that come together and, and, and what is the dominant factor in our life is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us love, that gives us hope, and we can live together in peace and harmony. And, uh, you know, we've got Republicans and Democrats. We've got all kinds of people. But you know what? For the most part, we all love each other and get along wonderfully. Listen, we got to pray for our country. Would you join me today? Heavenly Father, I just pray for the United States of America today. I pray peace. And I just like that song says, I speak Jesus over our country today. I speak that in the name of Jesus and in faith. And Lord, I pray for a revival to come to the USA. I pray, Lord, that uh, instead of our cities being burned with physical fire, that there would be the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in our cities, Father. Instead of buildings being destroyed, I pray that strongholds would be destroyed. And God, I pray, Lord, for a revival. And I pray for, God, a, a justice. I pray for a peace. I pray for love to prevail. And Lord, today especially, I pray for protection upon our police officers. God, every man, woman that is serving in that capacity, Lord, give them the strength, the courage, the moral uh, fortitude that they need to be able to go on and, and uh, to, to do what they need to do, Lord. And God, I pray, Lord, that, uh, that, that, that you would guide the efforts, Lord, of, of the Church of Jesus Christ in these days to reach out and love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we're so glad that you've joined us on this Facebook Live broadcast. We're going to jump into the Word of God today. I pray that you have your Bible with you, maybe some paper, some a pen, that you can jot down some things. And uh, that's, we want you to take some notes. You know, it helps to write things down, you know. So I'm going to tell you what to write down. And let me tell you, this particular teaching tonight out of the book of Philippians, it uh, really is not something that you can just quickly assimilate and go, oh, I got that. It's really something that you need to think about, meditate on, go back over, restudy it, relook at the scriptures, think about your life, reflect, self-reflect, uh, do some journaling, whatever it is, that, however you take the word of God and get it down into your spirit. That's what we want to happen uh, tonight. Uh, so I wanna be t I want, I'm going to be talking today about how to be joyful no matter what. By the way, as long as I've got coffee, I'm joyful. No, I'm just kidding. I'm jo I should be joyful no matter what by the Spirit of God, right? But uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some good news. We've had a, a year that's going to go down in history as, as a horrendous year. I mean, the coronavirus, uh, we've already had a tropical storm move through and cause devastation the whole death of George Floyd, the rioting, the looting, people p positioning for uh, politically for elections, the mud slinging, the dirt throwing, the problems. Let me tell you, if you watch the news too much, it's very easy to get discouraged. And that's why I'm actually chose to teach out of the book of Philippians, okay? Because the book of Philippians is all about being joyful. That's one of the major themes throughout the the book. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know there's going to be problems in the world. Jesus even said in this world, you're going to have tribulation. And I know actually from my study of biblical prophecy that that as we continue towards the end of the age, there's going to be a lot of, 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 of difficulties that, that, that we pass through. But I want for my life and I want for the people I pastor, your lives, I want us to be able to say, I have joy, no 
matter what. You know, there's a lot of people that uh, they don't enjoy life, you know. They just kind of endure life. And, and I don't want to live my life that way. I don't want to look back and say, well, I gritted my way through that and I made it. Hallelujah. No, I want to say look back and go, you know, in spite of everything that was going on around me, I had the joy of the Lord that was my strength. And God helped me. I want to be joyful no matter what. And you know, I've even discovered that some people can't even enjoy happiness. You know, uh, they, they don't enjoy the good times because they think somehow that their life has to be perfect before they can be happy. You know, they think if I could just change my situation, life would be great. If I could get rid of all of my problems, but how many of you know that's not going to happen? There's no such thing as a problem-free, stress-free, perfect life. If you're going to learn to be joyful and happy, we've got to learn how to be joyful in the situation, in the problems, in the very experiences of life. Now, let me tell you, there's a difference between happiness and joy, right? Happiness comes from the word happenstance. That's where we get our word circumstance from. It depends on circumstances. It depends on what's happening. Look around the world today, everything that's happening, it's, it would seem to be impossible to, 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 be, to be joyful. But that's where joy is different. Joy is internal. Happen, happiness is external. Joy is internal. And, and you know, you can have a happy time at Disneyland, and when your day is over and you leave, then your happiness is gone, right? Well, joy isn't like that. Joy is something that's constant in our life. And so the question becomes, how do you have joy in spite of what's going on in your life or even in spite of what's going on in the world? How can we have joy no matter what? And I think that Paul teaches us this in the book of Philippians. And that's why we're in Philippians. So open up your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole passage today but uh, that we're going to be studying. I'm going to read it as we go through the teaching, but, but I'm not going to read it and then reread it. So I just want to read a little piece of it from Philippians 1 and verse 18, the very last part of that verse. I'm going to read it out of the New International Version today. This is what it says. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Listen, Paul is rejoicing in spite of his circumstances. And he's rejoicing because of some unforeseen things that had happened because of his, his circumstances. So, But what he says basically is, listen, doesn't matter what's going on in the world. I'm going to rejoice and keep on rejoicing. And so the background of the story today is that Paul, for the last four years before he had written this, has been very in very miserable circumstances, okay? He spent two years in prison in Caesarea for a trumped-up charge. Then he's put on a ship to Rome to appear before, of all people, Nero, who's not known, by the way, for his niceties towards Christian, Christians. On the way, he's shipwrecked, bitten by a poisonous snake, uh, waits the winter there, continues on to Rome, and then spends another two years in prison awaiting trial, perhaps even to be executed. And during this two-year period in Rome, he's chained to a guard for 24 hours a day. He absolutely has no privacy. Every four hours, he gets a new guard. Yet in spite of all of these situations, this is what Paul says, I am going to rejoice and continue to rejoice. Man, that is a mature attitude. And that's the spirit I want to have in my life. And that's the spirit I hope that you can pull out of this Bible teaching and get down on the inside of you today. Uh, so when we look at Paul's life and the difficulties that he had, you know, none of us are really probably going through anything like that. And so perhaps complaining isn't the answer, but studying the word of God is. So what is Paul's secret? You know, how, how does he say so positive even while he's in prison, you know, how does he uh, triumph over his troubles and delight even in his difficulties? How does he stay so happy, positive, joyful, in spite of the fact that everything has not turned out the way that he had planned it? And uh, by the way, is there anyone in 2020 who your uh, things have turned out exactly the way that you planned. I, I don't think so. But anyway, 
Paul gives us four secrets here, and I think they're very powerful secrets. I want you to write these down today on a sheet of paper. Maybe, you know, take notes some way or another. But, but these are what I call the four essentials for joyful living. And, and I believe that this Bible study can really help us, especially here in June of 2020, in this stressful, stressful year, this can help us. The first thing that we really need is we need a perspective to live from. Let me write, write that down, a perspective to live from from. Now, I don't know what problems you have. I don't know what they are. They might be financial or relational, family-oriented, work-oriented, whatever. But let me just say that your problems are not so important as how you are looking at your problems. The lens that you look at, look through to see your problems is more important than the problems yourself, themselves, and that is called our perspective. Your perspective makes the difference. And so let's see the perspective tonight that Paul sees from. Uh, verse number 12 of uh, Philippians chapter 1, this is what he says. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me. Okay. You know, uh, what's happened to you? during this period of time. He says, what has happened to me? This relates to us. What has happened to me has really served, he says, to advance the gospel. In other words, Paul says, I can see the best even in the worst. I can see God at work in the problems even when things don't go my ways. And he really names two, two different things that, that, that are encouraging to him. You know, because of what has happened to him and how the gospel is being advanced. First of all, non-believers are being witnessed to. And uh, the second thing is that believers are being encouraged. Let me read verse number 13 for you. He says, as a result of what has happened to him, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, let me tell you something about Paul. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome, and I'm sure he wanted to have a big gospel meeting there where people would come to Christ, but instead, God puts him in prison where he ends up writing, by the way, one about one-third of the New Testament. He is literally chained to the palace guard. The praetorium guard were really the crack elite troops of the Roman Empire. They were personally chosen by Caesar. To, they, to, they were his bodyguards. They were the highest paid people of the empire. And when they retired after 12 years, they were actually made leaders in Rome. And so there's really not a more strategic group that Paul could have witnessed to if he's going to reach the Roman Empire. I mean, how crazy is that? God puts Paul in Rome. Nero pays the bill, chains a future leader of Rome to him every four hours. And so if you figure that out, in two years, in two years, at just four-hour shifts, Paul had witnessed to 4,380 different guards. Now, those guards, at least some of them, had an inside route to the emperor. And as a result... Even some of Nero's family became believers. We know this because, you know, history records that Nero had a had that, that his his wife had a wife and his and his mother and his children. He had them all killed, believe it or not, because they had become believers. And so kind of a chain reaction happened there. That's kind of a little play on words. He was chained to the guards. The guards told, you know, someone else about Christ. They told Nero's family about Christ. So there's this chain reaction going on. He kind of had a captive audience and and uh, and God, God used that. So two things are happening because what has happened to Paul. This is his perspective on his life. First of all, his life's a testimony to unbelievers. He said, and, and uh, and he says, I, I know, excuse me now, I know that, 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 that those that are listening to this teaching tonight, uh, you know a lot of different people, right, who don't know Christ. You, you know them. I, I don't know them. They're from your work. They're places that you go, people in your family. And the truth is that all of us as believers, probably including you who are listening, you have some problems, 
uh, in, in your life. So what if you took this perspective about your life, the same perspective Paul took, right? That you could actually share pieces of your life with people that don't know Christ in a positive way as a testimony, you know? Now, I'm not advocating that you put your marital problems and, you know, your difficulties up on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever. I am saying that what you do is that you work through those issues. You find the good in it. You search for what God is doing in you, in others, through this thing. And then you you share with some of those people what God is doing and how God is helping. And maybe you need and this perspective in your life. One day, the problems that you're facing right now, your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, whoever they are, they're going to be going through the same or maybe similar circumstances, and you can help them and encouraging by encouraging them. So you've got to g gain a perspective on your problems. Let me tell you, here's a great perspective for you as you look at the race riots and, and uh, you know, the problems they're having in our world against police, etc., if you're part of Fountain of Life Christian Center, you attend a church. That's a great testimony to the world because we have love in our church, right? And that's a beautiful thing. All kinds of different races and there's love and equality and, and we, we care for each other, pray for each other, minister to each other. No one's above anyone at Fountain of Life. And so that's a beautiful testimony to unbelievers. So we need to have that perspective that whatever happens to us in life can be a testimony to unbelievers. And also Paul goes on to say that his life is an encouragement to believers. Verse 14 says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. In other words, Paul says, man, what's happened to me is encouraging others to be bolder. Our attitude towards problems can encourage other believers. You know, courage is, is courageous, is contagious, excuse me. It, it, it spreads like wildfire. Other believers became bold because Paul was being bold. Now, you may feel like in your life, you know, that your problems don't have much meaning. You know, a lot of people feel that way, you know, and the devil, which is your enemy, your adversary will tell you that if you're having difficulties, that it means nothing except for the pain that you are suffering. Listen, don't believe that for a moment. God can use your testimony. God can use your experiences. God can use your ups and downs to encourage others. And that's the perspective that we have to have if we're going to have joy in our life. Now joy is different from circumstances and happenstance and happenings. No. We don't that that's happiness. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is there all the time. We need to have a joy that God is with us even in our testings. And and, and so and so the lesson is that God has a purpose behind every one of our problems in life. Now, if your perspective is, man, the devil is just winning, I'm getting beat down, I'm I, I, I'm getting defeated, maybe you need to change that perspective to listen. In spite of what's going on, I am growing, or you're growing as an individual, and that you will eventually overcome, and that you're eventually going to have a testimony about this. Change your perspective. And when you get this perspective, really you're on your way to joyful living. Paul says that God has a purpose behind all of my problems and therefore I have a perspective to live from. Now listen, I don't share this often, but the, the, the early years of uh, Jareen and I's ministry were, were, were very difficult, very hard actually. The first church that I, I pastored struggled financially in a horrendous way. And under district supervision, uh, we actually took that congregation and merged it back into a congregation that that church had split off of um, years before. And uh, but that was a very difficult thing for us. The second church I pastored decided, after a, even after a huge revival, by the way, among uh, people of, of other races, it was basically a white church when I took it. And, and uh, we reached out to the community, and many people in the community began to come and... and uh, that little white church decided to get rid of me, okay, to vote me out, send me packing, man. I'm, I'm leaving out a million details here. But let me tell you, that hurt in my life was so real in those days. I literally cried 
physical tears every day for about a month. I mean, it, it was horrendous. But I have a perspective about it now. I wish I would have had that perspective then, but... You know, I became a missionary and I wound up spending a lot of time with other pastors, with uh, other leaders and congregations and small groups, etc. And, and it was incredible how sometimes my experiences related to theirs and I was able to share God's power and God's ability to bring you through those things. And, and so today I can be joyful about that. And even in those days, as I was a missionary, the joy started to come as I realized that God wasn't, I didn't go through all that pain in life, you know, just, just to suffer. No, I went through it so I could help others. And that brings me joy, right? So we need that perspective to be able to live. Okay. The, the second thing that we need is we need a priority to live by. When things get tough, we need to know what's really important in our lives so that we can distinguish between the trivial things of life and the significant things of life. So what are your priorities that you live by? Uh, I, can be, I can live my life based on my problems or I can base, live my life based on the priorities that God has. Now, I'll tell you about my priorities in life. I've, I've had these same priorities for many years. I've preached them in our church. First of all, my person, my first highest priority is my personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make it to heaven. That's more important than anything else. I, I, I want to be have a solid relationship with Jesus. Uh, my second priority is my wife, Jereen. My third priority are my children and my grandchildren. And my fourth priority is the church that I pastor. Okay, so that's kind of my priorities. And I have a funny story to tell. Uh, you know, my life can sometimes get way too wrapped up in the ups and downs of Fountain of Life Christian Center. You know, especially a number of years ago, I was truly a workaholic. And I've kind of let go of some of that now. But but I was very much a workaholic in those days. And, and uh, you know, and, and I remember a few years ago when Hurricane Ike was threatening Houston, right? I don't know if you remember that, but Doreen and I were having this discussion about whether to leave Houston and go to my mom and dad's and kind of shelter out there during Hurricane Ike or, or to stay here in Houston. And I wanted to stay in Houston for the church's sake. I wasn't sure how long it was going to last. What if I couldn't get back by Sunday? I needed to be there for church, all those different things. And Doreen said to me very sweetly, but quite strongly, by the way, she said, I just want to know when your family and I, your wife, become more important than the church. Am I a priority or not? When do I become a priority? And you want to know what I said? Right now. Let's pack up and go to my mom and dad's. So anyway, I had a priority to live by that helped me make the correct decision in those days, other moments in my life, I've I've uh, decided to make the kingdom of God, the church, you know, ministry a priority in life. So e either you'll decide what's important in your life, or you're going to let other people decide and circumstances decide what's important. So if you don't choose your priorities, what happens is you go around putting out one fire after another, living your life. Uh, simply from problem to problem and not really choosing what's important. And so living your life with joy, all right, is knowing what's important to you. Paul had a priority uh, that was important to him, and that was that the gospel of Jesus Christ be preached. Let's read verses 15 and 16 today, all right? Paul says this. He says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Paul was saying, look, there are good guys out there preaching the gospel. They're doing this out of love. But there are others that are just trying to, you know, to get me in trouble. Not only am I in prison, but they kind of want to kick a man while he's down. Then These guys are out there. They're attacking my ministry. They're jealous of me. They're envious of me. They're trying to rival me. And they're criticizing me while I'm in prison. They're stirring up trouble for me here. And how many know there's there's nothing that just steals your joy quicker than, you know, other people criticizing you? And this is what Paul says, verse 17. He says, the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but supposing that they can stir up trouble for me 
while I'm in chains. Now, can you imagine this happening today? Suppose a pastor was jailed today for preaching the gospel. And, uh, you know, and other pastors are out in front of the jail preaching, some trying to help, but others, you know, just trying to get this pastor in deeper and deeper trouble. They're stirring up strife and trouble. That, that's what was happening to Paul. That would be very disheartening. But you know what Paul did? Paul went back to his priorities, right? He didn't let these circumstances control his inner feelings of joy, but rather he went back to his priorities and he, and he, and he says, you know what? The gospel's being preached. That's my priority. And that's what he says in verse number 18. He says, but what does it matter? He asks a question. So what? What does it matter? The important thing is... In other words, the important part of my life, my priorities, the important thing is that in every way, from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, guess what he does? I rejoice. I rejoice that Christ is being exalted. And yes, I will continue to rejoice. You know what Paul was saying? He's saying, I'm not letting anybody steal my joy. Not circumstances, not critics, not criticism, not people trying to stir up trouble for me. You know, he's saying their motives might be wrong, their style may be wrong, but if the message is getting out, he asks this question, so what? Now, this question here in verse number 18 is the only question that's written in all of the text of the book of Philippians. And it's really a question of priority. In Greek, it literally means, so what? What does it matter? And Paul said he had to set his priorities, his, val his values, and not allow little things to steal his joy. And so, the, the, the question becomes, you know, like, here's, let's apply this a little bit. How many arguments in your marriage are over little things that don't really matter? Is it worth losing your joy over? No, it's not. How many little things in life upset you? Someone cuts you off while you're driving or, you know, all kinds of different little things that can try to take our joy from us. Listen, don't allow that joy to be stolen from you. Allow the joy uh, that you have in Christ to be, uh, in, you know, to, 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 to overcome and live according to your priorities. You got to know what's important for you in your life. And you might be thinking, well, you know, pastor, you know, I'm not a pastor or preacher, you know, I don't preach the gospel. Well, you, you could and you should, right, by sharing it with others. But, uh, but you know, there's a lot of other godly things that can be our priorities just besides preaching the gospel. Uh, and this lesson, the lesson in all of this is that we need to focus on what really counts. Focus on what really counts. Focus on what's important to you in your life. I, I recall a moment that occur, occurred really quite a few years ago. The church had taken a strong financial hit. Our daycare had closed and it was a difficult season for me and my wife and my family. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was, I was about ready to, you know, kind of throw in the towel. I was so discouraged. I remember I pulled in one day to the church and just pulled right in the driveway. And it was brand new. Everything was mowed beautifully that day. The church was looking great. And I sat up and I looked at the church. And I thought about if that, ch if that church is not the church. The people are the church. I thought about the people in the congregation, and I thought how wonderful they are and how I love them and how good and kind they'd all been to my family. And uh, I'd been debating in my mind, do I, do I stop pastoring this church? Do I run? Do I quit? You know, I'm like anybody else. I have bills to pay. And so I made a decision. I was going to seek first the kingdom of God. And in that moment, I... I decided I'll just go get a second job and continue pastoring and believe that God will put all of this back in the way that he wants. You know what I was doing? I was really living by my priorities. I was saying the people that I pastor are more important than the money that I make. And that's an important thing for me to learn, to grow. And uh, so I, you know, th th these are real things. So I, you've got to ask yourselves in the, in, the, in the difficult moments of life, what are my priorities? Uh, what are godly priorities? How about your family? 
your mom, your dad, your kids, your grandkids? How about prayer? Is prayer a priority in your life? How about the church and its ministries? How about, you know, doing something nice for someone who's hurting? What's important to you in life? You say, well, pastor, you know, my home is important. Good. Invite people over. Let them share the beauty and the joy of your beautiful home that you have. And have dinner, you know, uh, you know, live by your priorities. Another example of this was was Jereen, just a, you know a few months back. Her sister was having major surgery up in uh, Minnesota and Iowa, and and Jereen made a decision. Her and Dorinda made a decision. They were going to just go up there and spend that time with Dorinda's mom and with Jereen's sister, and and minister to her. And and at that moment. Her priority was her sister not leading worship at Fountain of Life. And that was difficult for, you know, those ones who were there, you know, no keyboard. But, man, I'll tell you, I'm so proud of our praise team. They just pushed right through that like nothing, man, you know. They're, they're there to worship Jesus and lead us into the presence of God. And so, anyway, this is powerful stuff. Living according to your priorities. This will give you joy in life. It will give you joy. Uh, Proverbs 3 and verse 6 in the Living Bible says this. In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Then the third thing that we need is we need a power to live on. Write that down. I need a power to live on. In other words, man, I need some strength to make it. I got to keep going. Life can wear you out, right? Especially when there's one crisis after another, like we've had this year, you lose your energy, you lose your power, you lose your strength. Well, the scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And some of you might be ready to throw in the towel and you might be thinking, man, I've done the best I could, but it's not good enough. I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm ready for all this to end. What you need is a fresh power supply. And that's what Paul needed. Paul acknowledged that. He acknowledges that he also needed some power to be able to make it through the difficult moments he was facing. This is what he says in verse number 19. He says, for I know that through your prayers, prayers, and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect, notice what he says, and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. Listen, Paul says, I have two things that are giving me strength that are keeping me going in spite of four years of imprisonment. First of all, he says it's the prayers of other people. Uh, you know, listen, don't discount the power of prayer. When you pray for someone else, you're strengthening them. When somebody prays for you, they are strengthening you. The truth is we need each other. And a lot of times Christians want to go through things all alone don't do that. Let others know about your struggle. Not everybody, no, of course not, but some people that you love and trust that you can text and you can tell them, keep this confidential, but pray for me or, or share this with everybody. Pray for me, but prayers will give you strength. And then what else gives us strength is the help of the Spirit of God. Man, it's like that old song says, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. We need him every moment. We need God because when we have God, we have hope. And hope brings us joy. You know, that's I want you to notice the verse hope, the word hope in that scripture. Paul says, I eagerly expect, and he says, I've got hope that I won't always be in shame. Be, be ashamed. Uh, here's a little phrase that I, I'd like to memorize this and keep it in my mind. You gotta have hope to cope. Right? How, how are we going to cope with all the stuff in our world? You've got to have hope to cope. You've got to have, have hope that God is going to do something in our nation right now. You've got to have hope that God is going to do something in your family right now. You know, Cornell University did a study of 25,000 prisoners of war from World War II. And here's what happened. As they studied their journals, their lives, the things that they wrote in letters, etc. When hope died, they died. They found out that men and women can handle tremendous stress and tremendous pressure in life as long as they have hope. But the moment you've lost your hope, you're doomed, right? And so you've got to have hope. And so, uh, you know, you, you need to, you know, to have a, a source of strength that gives you hope. 
God has an answer to your personal energy crisis today. All right. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who does what? Who strengthens me? God wants to strengthen your hope today. And the hope uh, and the joy comes, excuse me, from the Lord. And Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength to rejoice in God, rejoice in who he is, rejoice in what able to, to do. Listen, as long as you have God, there's hope in your life, right? And that joy ought to give you some strength. And so uh, here's the lesson. The, the lesson is with God's power, there's nothing that can devastate you in your life. This is about being joyful no matter what. You know, I think of that old story of that songwriter so many years ago who, who he, uh, his name is Horatio Spafford. He lost his wife and two daughters on a, when a ship went down in the Atlantic Ocean. And as he was going back to England on the ship, the captain of the ship called Horatio Spafford out and said, this is about the area that the ship went down in. And, and it was that evening that he went back to his room and he, as he, his meditations on that day, uh, wrote the, the the song "It Is Well with My Soul." It was written out of desperate depths of of sorrow, but he had hope. Why? What was his hope? His hope was that God was in control of his life, the dest his destiny, and that one day he would see his daughters again. Right? He had hope, and with God, there's always hope. So we need a, a priority. Uh, to live uh, by and we need power to live on and lastly tonight we need a purpose to live for right Paul is old he's tired been in prison for many years he's ready to go on to heaven they've taken every single thing from him his friends his ministry his freedom his privacy and they've taken everything except him from him except the one thing that cannot be taken from you and that is a purpose to live for let me read this passage it says this, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And this is the key verse here. He says, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Paul says here in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, don't get me wrong. Paul is not suicidal. No, absolutely not. But he is anticipating death. He gets, you know, he's getting older. He realizes, you know, that. And he's not afraid of dying. And and and, and for Paul, death is just on to better things. It's out of the prison. It's to be with the Lord, you know. But he says this, while I'm here on the earth, I have a purpose for living. And, and, and so I'm going to ask you a question. How would you fill in this blank? Paul said, for me to live is Christ. If you would write this down, for me to live is, for me to live is blank. What, what is your purpose in life? And, you know, I'll tell you, the ads on television, on the radio, on social media now, everywhere, they tell us things, uh, what we really want to hear. And, and, and based on advertising, I would say that most Americans would fill in the blank one of these three or four ways, all right? They would say, for me to live is possessions. Oh, yeah, get what I can, you know, can all I can get, set on the can and spoil the rest. Get, get, get. Uh, someone once said, "We buy things we don't need with money we don't have. We don't have to impress people we don't even like." <laughs> That's crazy, right? For me to live as possessions, I hope not. I hope not, right? Others say, "Well, for me to live as pleasure, you know, if it feels good, do it. You know, anything to make me pleasurable." 
anything to relieve my boredom for just one little moment. But, you know, every Monday morning we got to go back to work. You know, life is still the pits, right? Pleasure doesn't last. Uh, others say for me to live is power or position, prestige, popularity. You know, uh, image is everything, you know. Uh, you know, how crazy, like you can be so popular on your college or high school campus and then, you know, you come back two or three years later, nobody even knows you. One moment you're a hero, the next moment you're a zero. So, you know, these things don't last in life. And that's the problem with living your life for the things of this world. There's no ultimate fulfillment in that. And uh, you see, you see, Paul had a, a long-term goal. He wanted to live his life in the light of eternity. This is what Paul said in Philippians 3. We're jumping ahead a little bit in the book. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. You can turn over there with me. It says, forgetting what's behind, straining forth towards what is ahead. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, listen, I'm running the race, I'm reaching out, but the goal, the prize, has nothing to do with what I can grab on this earth. It has what it has to do with what I can, uh, you know, grab in heaven. That I want to invest in something that's going to outlast me. I want to live my life according to eternity's values. I want to live for Christ. I want to live for, 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 for that moment when I meet Jesus face to face. And uh, that, that will bring a person joy on earth because that will drive you to your knees to intimate times of prayer and communion with the Lord. That will drive you into giving things and loving others and caring about others and, and, and being concerned over things. Even as you watch the news, listen, that, that, that drive for eternity, you'll be praying prayers like this for our country. Lord, send revival to our country. Lord, calm the, the anger in people's spirits and hearts. Lord, stop this looting and violence. You'll be, you, you'll be praying for justice. You'll be praying for these things. And, and uh, these, are, these are all important things in our life. And, uh, and, and so I want to give you a little, uh, as we close here today, I want to give you a, the, the secret of joy. And I've known this since I was a little kid, man. I, I guess there was a little song that we sang back in, in Sunday school when kids church when I was just a boy. And by the way, that was quite a while ago. But anyway, uh, the secret of joy is a little acrostic, right? J-O-Y. And uh, this has to do with first, Jesus first, right? The J stands for Jesus, Jesus first. The O stands for others second. And the Y stands for you third. Listen, if you'll live your life like that, it'll produce a great deal of joy in your life. Listen, years and years ago, I did a, I did a, 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 a sermon it was called, entitled, What Would Jesus Say to Madonna? Okay, like the singer. And uh, one of the things that, as, as I researched that sermon, was, was I found that Madonna basically, at that point in her life, was living all for herself. And this is what she said. She said, I absolutely have no joy in life. And I don't know if anybody in, that I even know that has joy. You want to know why? Because it was Madonna first. Madonna second and Madonna third. And at that time, I found a quote from a, a, a princess, uh, a, no, not, not princess, but uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, that sweet little lady who spent her whole life serving others. And she said this, she says, I don't even know any moment in my life that I don't have joy. Let me tell you something. Joy doesn't come from serving yourself. It comes from serving others, and it comes from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that as you think and meditate about this passage, that you would say, you would say, for me to live is Christ. Put Christ first. Put God first in your life. And then you'll find that the joy will always be there. And that joy will give you strength. That joy will give you hope. And so these are the important lessons of life. And so 
Anyway, let me pray with you today. Listen, this uh, teaching will be online. And, uh, you know, this won't go away. It'll be here underneath Fountain of Life Christian Center, I guess, forever. So you can watch this again if you, if, you, if you need to. But let me just pray for you today. Let me pray that God will strengthen your hope and your resolve. And, that, and let me just pray that you'll have joy no matter what. I want our church to be joyful no matter what. You know, no matter what's happening in the world. We've got a hope that goes beyond the world. We've got a we've got a future that goes beyond the future of the USA. We've got hope that we will be with our God forever. Amen. So let me just pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for who has ever has watched this teaching online tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them, bless them, help them, encourage them. And Lord, most of all, I pray that they would find a way to be joyful no matter what. Lord, I pray for them that that joy would be so real that it would overcome any circumstance in their life. God, I pray that you would give them a powerful perspective on their problems. I pray that you would give, let them understand what their priorities are. I pray that you would allow them to have your power, your strength to, 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 to live for. And I pray for them today, right now, that you would encourage them. And I pray that you would give them that purpose to live for as well. That they would live for Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, we want to encourage you today. Uh, to, to join us, if at all possible, Sunday morning in person there at the church. We've taken out a lot of the seats in the church. There's plenty of space for people to come and sit. Uh, you know, you can wear a mask. People are, uh, the bulk of the people wear masks when they talk to one another. It's a safe environment. We've got sanitizer, we hand sanitizing wipes. We sanitize the church every week. You know, if you don't feel comfortable in coming, listen, this pastor doesn't pressure anybody to come before they're ready. You come when you feel like you should, right? But if you can't come, listen, join us on Facebook Live Sunday at 1030. Special word of appreciation to Cedric and uh, for running our sound and especially to his lovely wife, Josie, who's been doing our Facebook Live broadcast for us. Listen, God is going to use that broadcast and people have listened to it. So anyway, listen, be encouraged. Be, we, we hope to see you soon. Thank you for your financial support as always. We love and hope to see each other soon. Amen.